Basketball players and basketball coaches, today I'm going to talk to you about different defensive terms that you're going to need to know the next year in your basketball season. So, especially if you're a beginner, this video is for you. You're not going to need a basketball because, of course, you're going to be on defense. So, what we're going to be talking about is different terms. The first term you're going to need to know is your defensive stance. If your coach talks to you about your defensive stance, what does that really mean? It means how you're playing defense. You need to get low. Your shoulders should be back. This is going to help you be able to change directions much quicker. You need to have your knees bent. Your knees should be slightly bent. 90 degrees is preferable, of course, if you're able to get down that low. And if you can't, you should be able to train yourself over the summer or extended break because of the coronavirus. You're gonna have extra time to really work on your different skills, and this can be one of them. So get down nice and low, keeping your knees behind your toes, keeping your head up and your shoulders back, and then, you should be also up on your toes. Being on your toes is going to allow you to change directions much quicker. That's going to allow you to not have your ankles broken when playing defense. That's another term. Ankles broken means that you fall down when somebody tries to cross you up. Next is having your palms up. What does your palms up do for you? Well, if you're playing defense, having your hands up like this, sure, it is handy. You can block different passing lanes and you would have your palms up like this or your hands up and your palms down if your offensive player that you're defending has picked up the, his dribble and he no longer is able to dribble that ball. But if he still has his ball handling ability or if he still has his handles, that means that you should have your palms up. And what this is going to do for you, especially if you're really close to your defender, it's going to stop him from being able to dribble in each of those directions because your hand is already there, ready to take away that dribble. Another handy tip why you would want to have your palms up is because by having your palms up, you can swipe at that ball when that offensive player is trying to dribble the ball instead of hacking down where you're going to get their arms and it's going to be a foul. Next, you may hear your coach say, be tall or be big. What does that mean? What that means is when you're in the low post and you've got a really big player who is trying to post you up or trying to shoot really close to the net when your coach says be tall or be big what that basically means is don't go and jump for that ball you don't really need to grab that foul especially if you're a much shorter player what you need to do is just have your hands straight up you don't want to be leaning over like this this will be classified as a foul you want to be straight up and that's going to allow you to contest that shot and also have the possible ability to still block the shot if they go into your arms. And as long as your arms are straight up and not leaning forward, you should not be getting that foul. Now the next term is what I just mentioned, which is contesting the shot. What does that mean? So contesting a shot means that you're in the offensive player's way to shoot the ball. You're contesting the shot. Now, how is that going to be beneficial? Well, number one, you're not going up to try and block that shot. Contesting it is just making it tough for the other player to shoot the ball. So one of two ways you can do that. In the low post, you can get tall, you can get big, or if you're out on the perimeter and you're closing out, that's another term I'm going to explain in a few seconds, when you are contesting your shot or when you're closing out on a player, you would go and stutter step out and have your hand up and not be trying to go and block that shot because you don't want to be gaining or gathering a foul. When you're closing out on the player, that means that a player is possibly shooting and you are running out to go and defend that player before they shoot. Now there are, is a strategy where you would go and go and try and block the shot and then continue to run down court and what that's going to allow you to do is now the shot's up, 
your other teammates are going to get that defensive rebound and they're going to pass the ball down to you because now you're continuing down court. We see this a lot when it comes to the Toronto Raptors. Chris Boucher and Pascal Siakam are two great prime examples of this. When we are looking at closing out on maybe a wing player, what you would want to do is stutter step out and having your hand up. That way you're stutter stepping out, that's taking small steps up on your toes. And why that is very beneficial is if your player or the player who you're running out and, and contesting the shot from, if he decides to fake a shot and instead of you jumping up to block that shot, what's going to happen is now he's going to drive and you can still continue to stay with him and defensive slide with that player. Now, defensive sliding, that's another term that we're gonna go over right now. When you're defensive sliding, basically what that means is you're down in your defensive stance and you are shuffling with your player. You're staying down low and your feet are not crossing. So, you're gonna be shuffling along, they're gonna almost meet and you're going to continue through. Now, why is this beneficial? Well, number one, as soon as you cross your feet and they change directions, you are probably going to fall and that's breaking your ankles. But going from there, what you're going to do in your defensive shuffle is you're going to push off. If you're going in that direction, push off from that leg. Now you're going to pull and push off again. Now, a type of foul that you could gather is a reach-in foul. I'm going to talk about the reach-in. Basically, what that means is if you are reaching in to steal the ball from the opposing player and you hit their arm, or in some leagues, you cross or go across their body to steal that ball in some leagues, that would be a foul. In all leagues, if you hit their arms, it is a foul and that would be a reach-in foul. Now, Going from there, what is a foul? You are not allowed to gain an advantage on the offensive player by making physical contact with his body. So, for example, if he is trying to, or that player is trying to drive by me and I stick my leg out, I'm moving and now because I'm moving and I've stuck my leg out in front of them, they've made contact with me, they now fall, it's a foul on me. However, if I want to take something like a charge, they'll be driving towards me with the ball, and if I stay straight up, or if you're a girl or a guy who wants to take a charge like this, and you fall, and you have your ground, which means that you were not moving, it's a foul on them. However, you don't necessarily have to fall for it to be a charge foul against the other player. And we've seen this quite a few times, especially myself. When I was in high school, I used to really like, because I was strong enough to go up, contest that shot, stay and keep my ground, and the other player would run or drive into me and they would fall down. It would look like it would be a foul on me, but because I held my own ground, it was actually a foul on them. Now, something that is against the rules in basketball is kicking the basketball. It's actually a call that can be called against you. That's kicking the basketball. Now, there is a benefit to doing that. So, for example, if a player is trying to get that ball into the low post, and there's a really strong player in the low post and there's a mismatch. A mismatch is when there's a tall player on a short player, or vice versa, a shorter player out in the perimeter, versus a taller player. The perimeter is the three-point line, low post is around the net. Now, what you would do is, let's say you've got the offensive team has a taller player being defended by a shorter player on your team, and you do not want that pass to go into that low post. As a defensive player, if they do a bounce pass, you can kick that ball out of the way. Now that's a stop and play. However, now you're stopping that mismatch from happening. So there is a benefit to doing a kickball, even though it is against the rules of basketball. Now, going into my last tip, and that is the box out. A box out looks very similar to a defensive stance. However, what you're doing, let's say this is a player, and let's say I'm guarding this as a player, and I am trying to get a defensive rebound. This player is trying to get an offensive rebound because they're on offense. I would go, I would box them out, and I would not allow them to get around me so I can shuffle and keep them behind me. You're not allowed to reach and grab onto that player, 
but you are allowed to use your elbows and your feet to keep them behind you. And when you're going in for a defensive rebound, I'm going to give you this tip right now. Know a player is shooting, box out your man, and then let, if you can time the shot and you can time it to the point where you look up as soon as it hits rim, that's the best uh, that's the best option that you have because that's going to allow you to know exactly where that ball is going to go. You should already have an idea where it's going to go as soon as that player shoots the ball. But now you can now move on the court accordingly to get that rebound and make sure you keep that offensive player behind you. Okay, so now we're down on the clipboard. Really quickly, the baseline is the line that is along the end of the court on either side. Next is also the sideline, and that's the line up the side of the basketball court. This is the key, and this is the three-point line. This is the free throw line. Now, those are some basics. This is the, the shoulder or the elbow. Different coaches will call it different things. And same as on the other side. And then there's also the block. Generally speaking, there is a block that's painted right here on either side. And when they say the low block that's what they're talking about now there's a piece of terminology that is very rare outside of Canada but the history behind it is very long but it's called the Russian spot it's basically behind the net along the baseline and roughly a couple of feet in from the three-point line along the baseline there's a strategy behind that on the offensive side and the reason why that's given na that name here in Canada for older coaches is because the Russians used to have really big centers and really big forwards and they would sit them right along the baseline they would drive along uh, with one of their guards they would drive they would draw up the zone defender or a help defender pass it down to one of those big players and then they would just take one dribble or even just a step in when catching it and then slam dunk the ball so that may be a terminology I may use on this channel and I, I, I know I have in some videos but that's not going to be a term that you're going to hear many coaches outside of Canada or really um, Eastern Europe really say or be called that in the states you may just hear it say hey watch the baseline that's what they're talking about so now let's say you have a player with the ball right there this defender is going to have the ability to either force them towards the middle of the court which means that they're going to be forcing them into a help defender as i just showed you right there or they may force them baseline which means that they're forcing the ball to be dribbled along the baseline now why that's helpful is because now against the baseline you can cut them off quickly and hope that they go out of bounds there's also another strategy that I used to use as a player where I would be able to and I was able to time players knowing that they wouldn't go up for a regular layup especially if they were going parallel with the backboard and I knew that they would go in for a reverse not many players will go up before the rim they'll always go reverse so I used to be able to time that and get a lot of blocks when players used to drive baseline go up for a reverse and I used to pin it all the time against the backboard because I knew what they were doing now there's also a thing called trap so let's say the red team is trying to get that ball down court there's a thing called a trap there's a trap defense there's a press defense and why is it called a full court trap or a full court press defense. So a full court press is when you're basically playing full court defense. That so you're guarding a player or an area of the court, the whole court. There's also a thing called a trap defense. And with that, this player, or these players I should say, are trying to trap the ball handler along the sidelines. And there's different strategies behind that. Some coaches will want to get the player trapped literally anywhere along the sideline that's okay I personally prefer it right here the reason why I prefer getting the player trapped here is once that offensive player has gotten past half what you're going to see is now he cannot go back over the half court line that's called an over and back once you're over you cannot go back so he is 
at that point essentially trapped at the half court line, the sideline, and because he's got two players around him, there's nowhere else for him to go. But that's also happening in the half court as well. So there's a thing called a 3-2 trap defense. I'm going to get into the different zones and what they mean later, but we'll just get some of these players out of the way just so I can demonstrate this. A trap half court defense can be played two ways. Trap again anywhere along the sideline or where I like to have players trapped is along the baseline and the sideline mainly because of course can't go out of bounds, can't go out of bounds, trapped, players finished. So in the half court there's a defense called man to man and also zone defense. So what we have here looks like a, a man to man defense and it is. So in a man-to-man -man defense, there's going to be a player on. You're going to have the next passes away, the defenders being one pass away, which is one step away. This player is two passes away, so that player should, that defensive player should be two big steps away. And now player three red is, of course, if you're looking at it as a circle, technically two passes away, technically three, but being two and a half big steps away puts him towards that low block player two would be on the high post or that elbow shoulder whatever you want to call it. either way now this would be a man-to-man -man defense with these players being in help defense help defense is when player one gets forced into another defender for example or if he beats his defender off the dribble player three will take step in to take a charge we explained that earlier on in this video and then player one would be stopped hopefully now in some leagues player three red and two red would have to be really understanding the rules because just like how a player on offense cannot be stuck inside of the key with the ball or even without the ball for more than three seconds in some leagues defensive players cannot sit in the key either those are the leagues that you probably will not be running a zone defense and if you are you'll be running a 3-2 let's get into the zone versus me or zone defense though a zone defense I'll get these offensive players out of the way is when a player is guarding an area of the court and not an individual player. So for example, in a 2-3 zone, which is a very common zone, you're gonna see player three guarding that area, player five guarding this area, player four, two, and one. Any of these overlapping areas are generally double team locations. That's when there's two players on the ball. So player one, let's say, was being guarded by player one red, and he drove the try to drive that gap Player 2 would then be double teaming player 1 trying to force them towards the sidelines. I hope that this video has helped you understand defense a little bit better. If it has, hit that like button and subscribe and I'll see you guys in my next video.